Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Incomplete Guide to Star Sector. We are here once again over our home of Larch, the Arid World, and I have made a few minor changes to our fleet since last episode. I pulled out a few ships we're going to drag with us and let them recover their demods, and I might even take like one more. Something, something cheap. Not you. Something cheap, like maybe... Not cheap, but maybe one of you guys. Yeah, let's bring you. We'll fix you up over time. And at some point we'll get around to fixing up a couple more demods on some of these bigger ships. But for now, that should do just fine. Last episode we... Oops, need more crew. Last episode, we did a big exploration loop and found a bunch of cool things to bring back for our colonies. And that should bring in some more money. We are finally getting to, well, nearly to the part of the game where we can finally start thinking about getting rid of our commission, which would just be great. I would love to get rid of our commission because it kind of affects, actually can very much affect your relationships with other factions. And that's leading directly to a 40% penalty to accessibility because we are currently hostile or suspicious or otherwise negative toward, let's see, Lettuce Church, Percy and League, and Tritachion. Yep. Thanks, Hegemony. Thank you so, so much. So, yeah, it's not, we're not doing great here. And I'm not sure why we're still so hostile with the Percy and League because... We're not at war with them. There is kind of a weird quirk of the system where over time, if you are with a commission or commissioned with a faction, the factions that they go to war with will just kind of steadily end up dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping over time where you'll eventually end up in a situation where you always have negative rep with them. So I would love to the chance to dump our hegemony commission at some point and to sort of work on our relationships a bit. That'd be great. We could even bring up like Path and Pirates, but I'm not super concerned about them. So, yes, that has been happening, and that should be something I want to work toward in the future. But today, we're going to go on a bit of a different mission. We're going to do a bit of a story mission today. And this one is one that I think was added in this version of the game, 0 0.96, so that it could have been 0.95, I'm not positive. I didn't run to it back then, but I also wasn't as adept at scrounging or plunging, plumbing the depths of the game to find all the different things to do in here. So we're going to be doing one called The Pilgrim's Path. And this mission, or this quest, will lead, eventually, directly into one called Knight Errant, which has to do with Electric Church. Both these deal with the Electric Church. So we're going to start by going to Gilead, and we're going to start the quest there, and there's a reason for that, because you don't have to, but I just kind of recommend it. And that is because when you go to this particular part of this quest, you're going to be asked to come back in a week. And if you didn't start here, you have to wait seven days. Otherwise, you can just go here, be like, yeah, I'll come back, do the rest of the quest, and then come back in roughly a week or a month or two. It can be a bit of a challenge if you have factions that you're hostile with, like we do, so we may have to tread a bit carefully here and there, and maybe even run home and get some bigger sticks to walk with. But yeah, let's get over here to... Aegis Exodus. And we go. Dodging all of the storms. Let's go in. We're actually not super friendly with these guys right now. We have a minus 20 rep. We should be able to dock here just fine. They just might harass us a little bit. Hello. So, at some of the locations around the sector, you'll find a, an option here where you can join the problems visiting the Electric Shrine. And if you do, you can end up going. 
Deorbiting to the surface of Gilead is strictly overseen by the Knights of Lud. Your shuttle must queue behind a flotilla of lumbering transports and haulers filled with approved industrial goods. This provides you with time to contemplate the face of Gilead. Its continents, once fringed only by alien algae equivalents, were seeded with Earth life by a far roving sporeship of the second wave of human expansion. The Aerodani Utopia terraforming megacorp followed, and its vast machines stabilized the climate and ecological processes. Lud came then, pulled down the machines, and the believers who followed maintained the world as a garden wilderness of astounding richness. Truly, it is a gem of the Persian sector. Your shuttle receives a ping from traffic control. Permission to descend. The landing bay, one of a score or so allocated to outsiders, is packed with parties of Ludic pilgrims, dressed in traditional hand weave led by robed attendants. One such stony faced attendant meets your shuttle on the pod and, wasting no time, firmly but politely inquires about your business here. Let's ask about the shrine. The attendant dutifully ex explains that the shrine commemorates the holy site where Lud first stepped onto Gilead and was brought prostrate to the shock of non-believers to kiss the earth itself. So overcome was Lud by the rapturous touch of divinity. Lud's influence spread by its own evident virtue, the attendant explains, and the industrial terraforming machines were brought down and flowers bloomed in the rubble. There is no mention of strikes, global storms, sabotage, apocalyptic flooding heat waves, or corporate terror squads in this narrative. Nor does the attendant mention that, technically, an entire planet owned by the Aerodana Utopia Terraforming Metacorporation was illegally occupied by a radical cult. Rather, the unbelievers wept as Lud revealed their sins and told them forgiveness was within reach on this garden world. It is an appealing morality tale delivered earnestly. Let's visit. And I'm surprised we're not getting shooed away here. I might be thinking about a different one, maybe Beholder Station, but we'll find out later, I guess. The attendant nods, explaining that you must leave your guards behind because this is a place of peace and all are equal on the pilgrim's path. Their request is an implied request for keeping up appearances. A couple of your guards, unarmed and trained for situations requiring this degree of subtlety, attend to your safety as per matter of course. You note other unusually small parties of pilgrims, plainly but clearly wealthy by their cut and carriage, led by their own shrine attendants, and accompanied by unusually muscled distant cousins. Nevertheless, the crowds filing out of the transport complex on a wide highway of beaten earth and cobble are enormous. Those that cannot walk are carried. No powered transport is provided. Let's walk the path. The path of the pilgrims leads up a slope covered in trees more enormous than any you've seen before. Though small in scale compared to the celestial phenomena that is your daily bread, their living architecture forms a natural cathedral. Dispassionate knights of Lud watch as attendants shuttle you through a cordoned path in an arc through a final grove of mighty sequoia analogs atop the promontory at the terminus of the ridge. It is a temple, struts and spars intertwined with the trees. Golden sunlight filters through heavy branches, and as the breeze lifts a whispering chorus of foliage, you catch on earthy scent over the mass of, human of humanity surrounding you. We'll approach the shrine. You have only a brief moment before the high altar of living wood. Small tokens and offerings are piled high amongst low, cheap candles. And there we go. And in a moment it passes. It is hot, and you are in a large and sweaty crowd full of pilgrims all wrapped up away from you, lost in their own worship. The attendants do their best to herd the masses along the main pathway. You must push through groups calling and crying and singing and praying. And return to the fleet. You return to the shaded halls of the transport complex. You notice a young novice watching you. As you accidentally meet their eyes, their smile widens. Target acquired. They approach, keen on proselytization to a spacer captain. These enthusiastic missionaries are a common enough affliction of space stocks, so you're not unprepared. As they first draw breath to speak, you seize the initiative and say, uh, Let's do... Thank you, but I'm already familiar with your religion. Your polite rebuff only kindles their pious urge to engage. 
So you've already heard the good news, the novice says eagerly. Blessed are you in the eyes of Lud, already and truly. Do you count yourself among the faithful, or has a sense of spiritual longing brought you to this shrine? Let's do... I was simply curious about the shrine. Wonderful. Blessed already are those whose spirit of reason calls them to the church. This is everything they could have hoped for. Everything they've been training for. You're given an earful and more about sin, forgiveness, redemption, and the spiritual salve of a simple life. Lots about walking a path and stories about how all sorts of people were impressed with the rings Lud said and did. The novice winds down and, noticing your endurance flagging, says, May, may I pray with you for a safe journey through the holy vacuum. Let's politely pretend to join him in prayer. You politely hold your hands together and mumble something prayer-like, taking a moment to appreciate the poetry of the quoted scriptures despite the naive delivery. When the prayer finishes, the novice beams a bright smile at you. Behind them, you notice that the shrine's curate Secreria, the priest of highest authority here, has been watching your exchange from a candlelit alcove. As if on cue, or perhaps because they were hovering nearby the whole time, the curate of the shrine steps up to you and the novice. Ah, the blessed faith of the young, the curate dismisses the novice with a nod. Forthright and, I'm afraid, tactless. My name is Conrad Duffy, and I am entrusted with the care of this shrine. I felt called to personally welcome you, Captain. I'll say... Thank you. It's very nice. Perhaps your interest here is purely secular? The curate seems, smiles a little, then says... You have been welcome whether you come in faith or not. It is my calling to serve the pilgrims who come here. A pause, then. And also those who are not pilgrims. He looks expectantly at you, his silence asking which one you are. Pilgrim or not? How do you know I'm not a pilgrim? The curate nods. A fair rebuke. It is simply that you do not look like a pilgrim to me. I should not be so rigid of mind. He clears his throat, then gives a practiced speech. Taken together, these shrines form the pilgrim's path. It is not merely a linear path through space, though, of course, he takes a patient tone. In secular use, the name has been given to the major shipping lanes between church and hegemony-controlled volumes. The curate continues. The pilgrim's path is a spiritual journey unique to each individual, as they explore and discover their faith through our shared teachings, the holy word gifted to us by the creator who touched the prophet's blood. The faithful are encouraged to make a pilgrimage at least once in their life, if they are able. Let's see. How many shrines are there? Gilead, Jengala, Hesperus. A handful, he says with a pause, eyes searching. Some have been lost over the years. Opus, of course. And others sanctified anew. There is Beholder Station orbiting Kumari Aru, the militant elements frequent there. And Voltern, though the present authorities are fickle about access. There was, or possibly is, a shrine on Killa. It is a dangerous place, however, to say nothing of the system's infestation of pirates. I would like to visit the shrines. Might you indeed, the curate says with a small smile. Even to a secular visitor, they represent wonders both beautiful and terrible of human and natural aspects of the creation. Some unbelievers, I am told, have inadvertently found their faith while walking the pilgrim's path. He shrugs coyly. Providence works in ways most mysterious. Here, Captain, let me upload to you the coordinates for all the known shrines of the pilgrim's path. He fumbles with a battered off-brain data pad, clearly uncomfortable with its use. Watch him how to do it. After a moment, you point out the correct sequence of commands for transferring the nav data. So it looks like we may have already visited Jangala, but we can go there again. My thanks, he says some humbly. Let's ask about cotton. Why not? <laughs> you know about cotton? The curate freezes, suddenly wary. Ah, uh, he lets breath out. Now there is a name I have not heard in a very long time. Before he can speak, the curate continues, it's nothing untoward. I do tend to the shrine in my transient flock, but I am not a hermit. Of course I've heard of Cotton, and met him on one occasion. 
I made my report to the Knights long ago, and that was the end of it. I hesitate to ask, but must. Why do you inquire so? Uh, we'll say I'm looking for him. And were we to find him, I would talk to him. The curate looks tired, but considers this response. Would he tell you anything you did not already believe? He sits down on a bench with a sigh. You need not answer that, and I would prefer you did not. People come to the shrine seeking answers. I have found that most who come here already have the answers they seek. Truly, what they seek is permission to accept that which they already know. The curate stands and brushes off his robe. If it pleases you, the curate does not meet your eyes. I shall attend to the other pilgrims now. And off we go. I'm going to check our supplies here. We're pretty good on most things. I'll we'll get a bit of fuel. Uh, that's fine. You know what? While we're here, are there any... You know what? We have a chance to actually... Quick save, because I'm a little stinker. And we're going to go dark. We're going to sell all this junk on the black market here. Get rid of you and you and you. Sure. Sure. Yep, you can have it. Hey, not bad. Okay. Okay. Let's get going to the next shrine then. And that's going to be... So we haven't visited Jangalas, but we have been there. Okay. It's going to be either Hesperus or Beholder Station then. I want to say it's Hesperus we need to go to. So let's try there. And I think this is the one that we need to wait a week for. Easy. All these... Oops. Wrong button. There we go. All these green marked places mixed up. Okay, here we are. Let's take a shuttle. Okay, this is the one. Okay. You are just beginning to make your way toward the shuttle bay when you receive a ping from your nav officer. The request to lane has been denied by traffic control. Strange. This should be perfectly routine. Nav, try again. Affirmative, Nav says. Moments pause. Captain, I have traffic control on the comms. Nav patches you into the comm loop and a young looking like knight probably initiate, appears before you. Blessed for the day, Captain. They just managed to hide the quaver in their voice. With apologies, your request to land has been denied. As you draw a breath to reply, the initiate's eyes flick to a notification and go wide. Uh, apologies, Captain. I, I mean, respectfully, I... The Excubitor Orbis wishes to speak with you. That's a word and a half. They say without stumbling on the title. Practice, you're sure. Transferring link. The Excubitor Orbis appears before you. Captain Corazar, he says by way of greeting, a stern gaze already fixed on you. The moment draws longer. He is the image of poise, perfectly content to wait for you to speak. A wrinkle appears and disappears by a mouth which appears fixed permanently on the precipice of a frown. Let's wait it out. <laughs> I haven't done that option before. The silence extends uncomfortably. He blinks slowly. He's really doing this. Some kind of test or challenge. Are you going to let him win? He isn't giving up. He continues to stare, absurdly, saying nothing. You notice the sub subtlest flicker in the image as the display corrects for signal fluctuation. Let's keep strong, keep silent. The hum of your ship grows in your ears. The sense of, in the sense of inhabiting your own body in a can hurtling around a gravity well. The incomprehensible webs of influence keeping you both in this place in the constant dynamism of crisis. Lower and higher dimensions twist and vibrate. A web of conspiring to hold you up or back, falling and clinging just so. Your technology has tapped these invisible quirks of physics to keep you warm, to keep your feet on the ground, to keep the air flowing a, follow a, flowing follow a rhythm, a meter. It is like music, in fact. If you listen carefully... It would be impossible to speak now. Listen carefully. You almost jump as the exec Excubitor Orbis speaks, pulling you back to the moment. You possess patience, he says. A new wrinkle appears beside his mouth. What passes for a smile among the knights of blood, you suppose? 
I did not expect it of you. You've won. Is this victory? It is an uncomfortable feeling. I ordered your landing request tonight, he states plainly. The protection of this world is my duty. I find that those with a history of exceptional acts oft test the charity of providence by taking exceptional risks. So we need to convince you that I'm not a risk? That wrinkle again. The sector's smallest smile. Spend not your time in this life on folly. Even our youngest initiate could see that you wear a risk like a badge. The secular procedures at hand are only part of my purview, he says. At present, I am more concerned with your spirit. He drops a heavy hand like a gavel on his desk. I am uninterested in more words. Listen well now, for I speak my judgment on this matter. Your reputation is suspect, Captain. I cannot in good conscience allow you to access, our, access to our shrine, the excubitor Orbis says. Find yourself redemption. If you manage to find some degree of it, then we may discuss the matter again. Seek virtue, Captain, he says by way of, by way of farewell. You know, I've never had him actually say that to me before. Maybe I ask about this now. How about we talk about redemption now? He tried to speak, but he's already terminated his end of the link. Okay. So let's leave and let's come back in a little while. And we might actually have to get our reputation with the church up. But for now, let's go to Beholder Station. And we'll visit that one here. So I'll see all of you when we're there. Okay, here we are. Originally a platform established by the Domain Explorarium, funding was only ever a trickle in light of little hope for practical knowledge to be gained from the study of Kumerian Xenolife. Post-collapse, administration was usurped by a particularly inspired Ludic curate errant, and the station turned into a site of holy pilgrimage for Ludic believers. Only a handful of approved scholars are allowed abora aboard now, though there are a few enough of those in this troubled age. The landing bay is filled with parties of Ludic pilgrims, many dressed in traditional hand weave, meeting the sub-curates. An attendant looks you over suspiciously and inquires about what business you have coming here. Let's let's make an offering. And give them ten supplies. Sure, why not? That might actually help with our uh, issue at Hesperus. Let's visit the shrine. You get experience with that one. The attendant receives your request with only the subtlest disapproval. To your surprise, a subcurate approaches to escort you to the shrine's viewing chamber. A vast, dim gallery opens upon a 100-meter diamond plate window, allowing a full view of the glory of Kumari Aru. Here, pilgrims quietly contemplate the miracle of creation, taking in the sublime and terrible beauty of the gas giant looming below. Storm systems the size of a standard terrestrial world churn with slow majesty, interlit with green-violet sheet lightning, teeming with xenolife. Does something incomprehensible look up from the lee of a dark cloud bank at the bright point in that alien sky? You exit the sanctum, still pondering what you saw and, perhaps, felt. And away we go. That one's probably one of the shorter ones, which is kind of nice in some ways. But let's see, we have a few more to go to. Let's go visit... Let's see, how well do the Sindrians like us? Oh, they do! Sweet. Okay, let's go. Before anyone changes their mind. We're off to Volturn. Okay, here we are at Volturn. Let's check the bar. Nothing. I am actually looking for more administrators at some point. Can't hire any more, but if we have one pop-up that has industrial planning, I might like to grab them. Let's see. Anything I need here? You know what? I'm going to get some from Sindria. That's fine, I think. Let's go to the shrine. With the flash of official iconography, iconography, instructions are returned from the Orbital Navigation Service, which attempts to track the innumerable human-made artifacts of the Volturnian Sea. Floating habitats, sprawling farm envelopes, transient mining platforms, and even ancient-style seafaring vessels. 
Your shuttle pierces the atmosphere in a long descent arc, slightly slowing to under the speed of sound as it approaches a bank of thick fog, illuminated by Esconia's primary. What at first looks like an ethereal castle is revealed by proximity to be a dismal, jostling accretion of barges parasited to a retired extraction rig. A shifty official meets your shuttle on the landing pad. Behind him you spot temporary weapon emplacements and shield modules stamped with the crest of the Cinderin Dictat. Pale conscripts in battered armor eye you warily while they suck down narcotic smoke. The official produces a trembling facsimile of a smile and looks you up and down. Uh, a pilgrim, are you? He asks unconvincingly. I'm afraid the shrine is closed today and tomorrow. Security concerns. The situation has been unstable. Now, you get turned away if you don't pick one of these two or if you don't have a Sindrian commission. If you do have a Sindrian commission, however, you'll get taken to actually what's a false shrine and you'll see different text. It'll be a little bit different. I think it'll still count for the mission, though. But we are going to make a donation. The data pad in the official's hand appears in the official's hand and he looks squinting to get a read on you. Are you a plant from internal security? A terrorist infiltrator? The options weigh on his face against his greed. It's no contest. Oh, 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 it is so difficult. The terrorists strike without warning at women and children and, oh, I'm thankful for the lion. A lesser man would simply bombard this planet into submission, but the Supreme Executor, these are his children and he is like a father. But even a father only has so many resources at his disposal. Why, if we had the credits to purchase better armor for our brave young soldiers, he had to gaze the smoking conscripts, now having a spitting contest off the side of the landing platform. Imagine how their mothers would feel if they were hurt by a terrorist bomb. Let's offer a thousand credits. Five thousand credits. The official suits back. 5k, done. It's a deal, the official says, excreting a wet smile. <laughs> I like that word. Offering his data pad for your payment confirmation, and we'll confirm. With the bribe transferred, the official nods and leads you through a security checkpoint while making obsequious small talk. At attention, he screams, setting the conscripts into a flurry of activity, dropping narcotic sticks and grabbing firearms. Satisfied, the official gives a wave and the thrum of heavy motors winding up the Winding up, preludes the doors of the shrine, cracking open just enough to allow your entrance. The receiving hall is empty of pilgrims and mostly dark. Hand sewn banners hang limply, their bright colors muted in the gloom. Benches and tables lay empty. You spot a light through a small doorway, the humble office of the curate sac Sacraria, and within, an old woman asleep behind a pot of tea, still steaming, set out on the desk. If the tea is that hot, you can't really be asleep. She smiles as she withdraws the pistol she was holding beneath her hand weave, opens her eyes, then places the pistol in a holster. Observant, if you are a goon, then I must say you are a higher grade than the usual. How may I serve? You seem heavily armed for a curate. It's just a pistol, she says. It's not that heavy. Shouldn't you be talking about blessings? She raises an eyebrow. I could arrange a blessing if that's what you want. She dips two fingers in a cup of tea and flings the droplets at you. Blessed be this pilgrim before me. May they find grace on Lud's path. May providence be merciful in hardship, and if not, let them bow their head in humble prayer to their creator, who made the stars all around begging forgiveness for their sins and for guidance on their path. There. She drops a hand on the table. You're blessed. I'm here to see the shrine. Then, she says, I am here to show you to it. Simon, she says to someone behind you, you may also put your gun away. You turn to look, and Simon does as she asks, giving you an apologetic little half-salute. The curate smiles, and with open hands shows you the way to the inner shrine. Not quite an hour later, you find yourself at the bottom of the sea, in the Luddock Shrine of Voltern. It is a creaking and unnervingly humid inspection module at the end of a modified extraction stack. 
a metal proboscis thrust into the depths of Volturn. It is also filled with guns, explosives, grenades, cell mags. Crates and racks are piled high, making the small space more cramped. A small shrine is set in an open space under a round diamond matrix viewport, which holds back a titanic mass of water. A few candles struggle to maintain even a decent flicker among the ranks of their dead comrades. There are pilgrims here of a sort. Their unwashed bodies smell of sweat and smoke. They speak and pray quietly. The curate Sacraria relights a candle from one that is burning and offers one for you to do the same. I'll light the candle. So the torch is passed, the curate says. Light of flame, light of faith. She gives you a sly look. Oh, it's just a candle. Let's say, look at the moment, the window for a moment. Specks float on blue-black, like stars in space and the light cast out into the crushing depths. It is an almost unsettling wrongness from a familiar image. Motes of something or other flick to and fro. Life prevails even here, under unthinkable oppression, the curate says. Let us be thankful, too, for the ingenuity granted to us by Providence. She taps the pressure hull, which resounds dully. See? We do not hate all technology. It is not just a candle. The Numa lives in these words. She is starting sadly, you think. Staring sadly, you think, at the candles before you. This is a troubling arsenal. The curate frowns. What troubles you about it? This is a shrine. It's not a sacred place. The book does tell us, blessed are the peacemakers, yet, the curate looks at you with hard eyes, peace does not make itself. Lud was no war maker, but Lud knew when to fight. By self-sacrifice, by martyrdom, did not Lud deliver victory? She gives a hand dismissively. This is rhetoric to you, perhaps, but to me it is more simple. I will not let more of my flock be taken to the minds of Cruor as sacrifice to some tin-pot Lucifer. Are you part of the Ludic Path? No, not at all. She gives you a look of some disgust. I am a curate of the Church of Galactic Redemption. What I do and what they do are very different. I hope, I truly hope you can see that. Her gaze turns to the weapons. I admit there has been... Contact? Each day is a test. I pray we do not stray too far from Lud. Leave the shrine. And there we go. Now you can come back on occasion and I think you can donate uh, heavy armaments to them. As long as you don't get caught. And... That should get you some more rep with the church, I believe. But let's move on to the next shrine. Let's go to Killa first. There we go. Whoops. Meant to go there. Lay in a course. Actually, you know what? Before we go, I'm going to go and gas up. And then I'll see all of you when we're at Killa. All right, folks, here we are at Killa. So they're coming to the shrine, too. Your fleet approaches Killa. Vague infrared readings from otherwise unremarkable terrain hint at camouflaged habitation beneath the regolith. There are definitely survivors hiding inside Killa, though no organized polity maintains open relations with the greater sector. And if the slagged halls of tramp freighter, freighters are any indication, the locals aren't very welcoming. Take a shrine to the beacon. Your shuttle descends toward the surface of Killa, following the landing beacon to an ancient lava sea peppered with craters. Tactical systems log the brief ping of targeting radar, but the signature suggests a handheld system too crude to pose a threat to your countermeasures. The landing site is far from any obvious ruins or landmarks. There is just a smear of crumbling temporary halves and cold, broken transports. Your shuttle comes to a rest on the landing pad, easing softly into the microgravity. The wreckage and debris is not so chaotic as it seemed from orbit. A swarm of dusty footprints lead, leads toward an airlock buried in an escarpment of some distance away. It appears that others have been using this site in the cycle since the war's devastation. It's an active scan. 
Your sensors officer performs an active scan of the area from your fleet as you wait on the landing pad. Your data pad barely flickers as one of the powerful beams sweeps your position. Your data pad pings as the results come in. There are low density voids beneath the surface, artificial density patterns, caves or bunkers or tunnels, ferric and non-ferric metals, some inactivity, some radioactivity. It reads about as standard as any report you've seen involving the smear and scatter of ruined human civilization across the Persian sector. The trail of footprints beckons you toward what looks like an airlock embedded in a nearby escarpment. Let's follow. You follow the path laid by others to the airlock. The manual controls allow you to pull it open to reveal a yawning black hole. There is no interior atmosphere, at least none to speak of. Ghostly veils of dust flex and twist in the electrostatic fields of the shrine, strong enough to overcome the low gravity of this world to hang in the near vacuum. Instructions are given by some unnamed Ludic priest who recites his words into crude repeaters awoken by your activity. Come only in peace, let rest the dead. We pray now in the words revealed to Lud. We'll look around. The ossuary is built from buried hulls, roughly welded in a chaotic but not artless architecture. No surface is quite level, and the original, faded, crumbling icons and lettering belie forgotten functions. Crew quarters. Attachment point. Purge before cycling. In the gloom, you begin to make out empty sockets, rib cages, countless femurs and spines. They cluster in recesses, corners, in storage spaces with hatches removed. You realize that the dust in the air comes from the bodies, the bones, slowly crumbling around you. The unknown priest's words filled the radio channels, made warbly and tinny by the low power of the repeaters. Fell from orbit like burning leaves, caught by wind and wailing, life breath stolen from mother and child. A dead suit's indicators blink from gray-black to green. It steps toward you. You instinctively pull back, hand on your sidearm. The figure pauses, adjusts something on its battered suit, and the helmet switches on its self-illumination. Its hands sign a channel ID, which you flick to. We have few visitors, says the same voice as the broadcast prayers, rough with age and disuse. So, this is what passes for the local curate Sacraria. There must be thousands of the dead here. The hollow eyes of the curate squint, unmoving for a moment. No, he says in a voice formed only a little over interstellar medium. The dead are numberless, the suit sags. Then, with a grunt, he turns and walks as if expecting you to follow. Moving deeper between rooms and halls, you witness galleries of the dead, bones and skulls carefully and artfully piled. You catch a glimpse now and then of pilgrims in ones and twos by their active vac suit indicators. The curate leaves into their contemplations. He stops and fixes you with a suddenly piercing gaze. The bodies, the bodies can be counted. Dust and bones. But not the dead. Their love, their life. No number remembers that. Pause. You understand? Their human experience is unquantifiable. Yes, curate says and brings a hand down to squeeze your shoulder. Yes, he says again, and you can hear the smile in his voice. Then, without a word, he disappears into some shadowy corridor. You are left among the dead. The webs of ash hanging in the air twitch and flow as movement elsewhere in the labyrinth triggers minor fluctuations in the, sta in the standing electromatic electrostatic charge. We'll stay a while. You stay a while in the ossuary of Kilia, of Killa, boy, reading, eyeballs. The hollow eyes keep silent vigil. Stacks and wings and arches and forests of human bone adorn every surface. The dust flux pulses slowly like the breath of a titanic creature. We're a turn. You leave the dead in their tombs within the battered crust of lifeless moon below. The flight in your return shuttle is uneventful. And there we have visited Killa. We have two more to go. Let's go check out Jangala. I want to go actually go to Yima Gate. We'll activate that for Runes and Giggles. And then we'll just bounce from there right to Corvus.
All right, folks, we are approaching Jangala. Let's go down to the shrine after I check for administrators. Nothing super interesting here. Wow, something got banged up when I smacked in the asteroid. And down to the shrine. The verdant continents of Jangala sprawl beneath you, crowned by huge weather systems churning lethargic and magisterial. Searing lines of orbital burn lasers flick out from Jangala Station, invisible until they cut slashes of plasma through the thick atmosphere. Burn Glow competes with rampaging electrical storms to illuminate the mountainous cloud formations from below. The hum of your shuttle changes pitch as it hits the edge of your true atmosphere, passing quickly into cloud cover. Beyond the viewpoints, human eye visibility is a view panes, human eye visibility is reduced to nearly zero. As the shuttle fires retros for landing, dipping well below the speed of sound by the demand of both nav rigs and good manners, your viewport begins to collect marching droplets of moisture. The droplets have an odd ochre coloration, and the clouds above a sickly green tinge. You've heard of this effect. Fine-grained spore analogs in the atmosphere. Let's look up the long-term effects of the spores. A quick datapad search reveals that, statistically, human activity within the Jengalan biosphere is relatively safe so long as proper air filtration and decontamination procedures are followed. Detox meds for accidental exposures are readily available, though many have unpleasant side effects. There are reports of individuals whose poor luck and lack of contingency planning, combined with vehicle malfunction during truly abysmal weather, has resulted in cases of long-term exposure to Jangala biosphere for days, weeks, and in one case more than a standard month. The resulting growths and inf infections appear to result in a singularly torturous manner of death. Look at the pictures. Because we're, you know, can't look away. Train wreck. At least, judging by the hollows available on the public infonet, which are indeed gruesome, a cynical part of you wonders if the authority, authorities allow distribution of these graphic accounts to promote protocol compliance. Your shuttle descends to the landing pad, the Jangalan foliage encroaching through its own ashes to reclaim the space. You pop a standard dose of anti-xenols and re-examine the quality of your breathing mask as the access tunnel takes a moment to perform a self-cleaning cycle on exposed surfaces. The air feels no different, yet. Maybe a little warmer, a little heavier with moisture. You will enter the shrine complex. The reception lounge is filled with parties of Ludic pilgrims in traditional hand weave led by subcurates in ritual hand washing. A glance upward reveals to the true cleansing. A battery of air purification units caught in a tangle of murmuring ducts. Foliage presses itself almost sensually against the outer viewports, letting in only dim light. The bent life seems to twitch, liquids oozing over the panes from cracks and bladders and tubules, leaving rivulets cutting across flaking encrustations. Between the zeal of the foliage and handcrafted charm of Ludic engineering, the place feels distinctly worrisome compared to the environmental containment you are accustomed to. One of the shrine's attendants scurries to meet you. The complex is kept overpressurized, they say, following your gaze. So if there were a breach, there'd be plenty of time to find and seal the leak. The attendant creates what must be intended to be a reassuring smile. How might we assist you? This seems like a difficult place to maintain a shrine. Bringing oneself before the sacred is not a matter of convenience, the attendant says serenely. That we must travail so to worship here confers upon the act an extraordinary sense of self-reflection, I believe. I hear some pilgrims go outside unprotected. Yes, that is true. The attendant cools a little, questioning your motives. We try to discourage, uh, sightseers. It disturbs the worship, you see. So here you have a choice. You can either go outside or not. If you do, you get a little tag added to your character that you'll see what it is. We'll, we'll do it here. It doesn't, to my knowledge, do anything yet in 0 0.96. If you are in 0 0.97 or beyond when you're seeing this, then that might have changed. And I suspect it's not pleasant, <laughs> but I guess we'll find out. I am no sightseer, 
but I do want to take, undertake the experience. They look you over skeptically. Are you sure of this? You desire this with full knowledge of what exposure to Jingala entails? The attendant brings your attention to a row of pamphlets and a tasteful wooden strand stand displaying what, at a glance, appear to be a selection of truly unholy skin conditions. Yes, I wish to go outside. The air hits you in the environmental lock, warm and wet, like high G shock foam. You step out alone, for this is how it is done. Oozing nets hang from the shrine complex, rhizomes sprouting luridly colored bulbs that glow in what passes for sunlight. Dust, or tiny bugs, or spores flit about, moving in swirls against the heavy and languid air. We'll keep your mask on. Mask on. Actually, no, we'll take it off because that gives us the, uh, the tag. Have faith. You reach up and loose your mask, drawing in breath from Jengala. Shadowly at first, then deeper. The smells of spice and rot and ammonia and fresh greens. Whatever may come, you know it won't instantly kill you, and anything that happens is reversible. Is that a tingle? A catch in your throat? Have faith. You follow the short trail you were told of. It seems nearly overgrown, feelers and tendrils brush against you. There are others. Maskless pilgrims, tears streaming from their red eyes as, and mucus from their noses, skin blotchy, white robes rapidly discolored by alien emissions. They meet your eyes, smile and nod in camaraderie, making the signs of blood for you. We'll join them. There are overgrown human figures, a statue garden. The forms blister with growths, crawling with tendrils, sprouting the fruiting bodies of alien life. One moves, not the wind, but another pilgrim, the gross taking hold. How long does this take? Hours? Days? It becomes distracting, hard to focus. You feel like you might die, but the feeling reaches a plateau, a sea of pain and irritation. You allow yourself to float in a buzzing, atonal headache, itchiness, torment, and something more. The green churns imperceptibly, all-consuming, ferociously regenerative, a cycle of life that could be born of Earth or an alien world. And you are within it, for all its horror and comfort. So we got Jengala Xenolife, heavy exposure. So as I understand, this does nothing currently, but again, this might change in the future. Let's go back. You undergo a routine de decontamination in a, strained, in a stained yet clean chamber built for that purpose. After an oddly smelling shower, a flicker of lasers, and another round of anti-xenols, you're given back to your given back your clothing. Everything is abrasively dry and smells of disinfectant. Breathing feels strange, still. You have to think about each breath, filling your lungs, then emptying them. You make your way toward the landing pads, past pilgrims queuing for the charity cafeteria, regrouping before or after visiting the shrine, and otherwise stowing their humble possessions. The flight in your return shuttle is uneventful, yet you are keenly aware of the thin envelope of technology protecting you from the ravages of vacuum and radiation. So that was Jengala. And that brings us back around to the first, sorry, second one we visited, which is Hesperus. Let's go see if we can get that grouchy old guy to let us in. So I'll see you all there. Okay, folks, here we are. Let's go see if we can get in. Captain, your nav officer reports. Traffic control is denying your flight request. Get me the excubator orbit on comms. Nav routes your comm link to the local system network. After what feels like a longer than necessary wait, a link finally establishes a connection. The excubator orbit appears before you. Captain Corazar, he says, way of greeting, a stern gaze already fixed on you. So we're, this is the same greeting as last time. You told me to find redemption. Yes, he says, his frown deepening. And I see no indication that you have found it. Why are you denying, denying me access to the shrine? Because you are an, an unacceptable risk. You choose sin after sin, and your bestrayed path will lead to sin sixfold once again. Blood declared that none are beyond redemption, he says, so I give thanks that it is the all-forgiving creator who is to judge your soul, not I. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that we need to have positive rep with the church in order to finish this quest, so I think this will hold off for now. 
and we will call this the end of the episode. And next episode, we'll do a few fetch quests and things for the church. Maybe see if there are any church-controlled systems that have pirate activity and are offering maybe, say, some system bounties and get those done. And then we'll come back and maybe he will have some slightly more open or less, at least less closed arms for us. But everyone, I hope you enjoyed the reading of all of these different shrine storyline quest bits. I think the lore in this game is really well done and very deep. And I hope you join me for the next one where we finish out this quest. But as always, my name is Hasman Kurzar. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.